mir flangen. Ja. Good evening, everyone. Um, my name is Cesar Zuniga, and I'm the chair of the community board. Uh, I'm just going to say a couple of things and then turn it over to Karen, who's going to, who's going to chair the, the tonight's meeting. Uh, first of all, thank you all for coming. Um, I think we all share some concerns about uh, some of the activity um, in this community related to uh, homelessness. What I want to say just very quickly is, um, you know, I, I think, first of all, no one chooses to become homeless. I think there are a whole set of factors that lead uh, folks um, in, into circumstances that uh, create homelessness. Um, and so, you know, what I want to sort of, I want to appeal to your sense of your sense of humanity and justice to like really like focus on solutions. I know there are a lot of concerns, and we're going to try to we're going to try to have DHS uh, uh, um, you know speak to those concerns. But um, beyond that, I think um, you know the 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 issues that lead to homelessness are much broader, um, and and uh, we should we should be open. We should open our minds and our hearts to really figure out broader solutions to the issue of homelessness, particularly in a community like Sunset Park where, you know, it's not just people living in, in hotels or in boxes or under the uh, the overpass, but it's people who are doubled up and tripled up, right? So it's, 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 again, it goes beyond just what our sort of quick notions of what we think homelessness is. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Karen and she'll, she'll preside over the rest of the meeting. Thank you, and again, welcome. Hi. Um, thank you. My name is Karen Rolnick. I'm the chair of the Ad Hoc Committee on Homelessness Issues for CB7. I'm glad to see so many people here. It's an important issue, and we want to hear what all of you have to say, and we hope we can answer your questions. Um, there are some journalists here tonight. Could you please identify yourselves and say who you're representing? I'll go first. Uh, my name is Jay. I'm a reporter from World Journal. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Pamela. I'm from CUNY J School. Thank you. My name is Natalia and I'm from CUNY J School. Okay. My name is Justin Mitchell. I'm from Brooklyn. Thank you. Mike McKay, Occupy Radio. Thank you. Okay. Welcome, everyone. Um, so, I said my name is Karen Ronlick. The co-chair is Barbara Lee. And I am also would like to mention that I'm recording tonight so that this helps me in writing minutes. And since so many new faces are here tonight, I did want to read our mission statement. And that is to ensure that homeless people in our district get the support and services they need while also ensuring that the presence of shelters does not negatively impact safety or the quality of life in our neighborhood. People who are homeless should be sheltered in their own neighborhood when feasible. So with that, I would like to open it up to our first guest, Councilman Carlos Manchaca, who will speak to us for a few minutes. Thank you, Karen and, and Caesar and the board. Uh, buenas noches, everyone. Mm -hmm. I'm really excited, excited that you're all here today to have a conversation, uh, not just with the ad hoc committee on homeless issues, but really with me, you have the precinct here as well, and other board members can can any board members identify themselves? Just raise your hand if you're a board member of CB7. Raise your hand. Awesome. Yeah, and no, of no. those, and behind, you raise your hand, right? With that said, raise your hand if, if you are a member of the ad hoc committee. Raise your hand. Okay, great. So these are the members in the committee that are really going to help really bring together those issues that you're bringing to the, to the, uh, to the room today. And what I want to I want to say is that we're really supporting the infrastructure of the community board as a place for discussion, for understanding, and for problem solving. And that's what we do here at the community board together. I'm really excited because the precinct is here. There's some nonprofits in the room as well that work with the homeless population. Uh, I think Turning Point is in the house as well. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, is there any, any other nonprofit that is working to ser to serve the the homeless population? Great. Can you identify yourself as well? Uh, good evening. One at a time. Mr. Pierre. I'm with the Council Housing Network. Right on. Thank um, you. Cesar Rodriguez. I'm with uh, Churches United for Fair Housing. 
Thank you. I'm Cassandra Gar. I work at the Healing Center. Healing Center, thank you. Um, Cesar Penegas, I work at the Samaritan Village, 49th Street Shelter. That's awesome. Thank you for being here. So we have a robust group of folks that are, oh, and then Turning Point, you can say hello as well. I said hello. Hi, Aisha Wall, Director of the Turning Point Shelter on Third Avenue, and yes, I'll go and run it. Wonderful. You want to say hello as well? I'm Ed Deloach. I'm the uh, program manager at our SRO in Red. Thank you. Thank you, Ed. So, um, and I know that NYPD might say hello later. Uh, Karen might ask him to say hello. But what I'm trying to say and what I'm trying to do right now is that we are a collective group of nonprofits, residents, community board members, NYPD, and we also have Lori here from the Department of Homeless Services who will be here to take down notes to be able to respond to anything that she can respond to. And then what I want to see is to support the ad hoc committee to bring other agencies and really create an interagency response to the things that you're seeing on the ground. And the first thing I want to say is that the public safety issue has, has risen to a really high fever pitch. People are feeling unsafe in our, on our streets. And some of that is connected to visual understandings of heroin, for example, needles, uh, some of that are, are, are uh, uh, crime statistics. And so uh, what I want to do is make sure that those things are happening in our neighborhood. No doubt we want to respond to them. And what's happening with homeless shelters is completely separate. And we need to make sure that we address all of it together, though. And interagency conversations are happening in other districts. And so we're using models to figure out how we can take intersections by intersections and bring a team to address that issue. And we want to make sure that we learn from that so that we can do that over and over again as a community of Sunset Park. Not just agencies coming from outside, but eight, uh, 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 really led by the community of Sunset Park. And that's why you're all here. So I heard you on public safety issues. Uh, I'm hearing that, that you might feel like those are connected to the homeless issues. We're separating, separating those two because those have no correlation. And that's in my conversations with um, the puppy. No, uh, with uh, the NYPD. You forgot to introduce him. And yeah, well, he, he's already, I think he introduces himself everybody. He may know more than you think. Yeah, right, it's true. That's true, thank you, Maria. So anyway, I'm really happy that, that we're all here having a conversation. We want to support the leadership. And I want to say finally thank you to Karen, who's been leading this effort. Thank you so much. Uh, we've had several meetings, and we're going to keep doing that in time. Thank you. DSS was here and NYPD, so they are also not the profits that are oh, dealing Speak with louder, we want to hear everybody's, everybody. He's pointing out that DHA and the police department are also nonprofits that are here tonight. And does Lori have a last name? Boozer. But I would like to. Yes, I'm, I'm actually going to mix things up just a little bit so that Lori doesn't have to reiterate things that I'm going to say in my chairperson's report. And uh, I just want to report on a few meetings that I had this month. One was with uh, Ivan at Carlos Manchaca's office. So this was a brief getting to know you type of meeting. And uh, I gave them a report explaining our mission and our desire to have liaisons with shelter management and wanting to establish community, community advisory boards with the shelters. They were very supportive of that. Um, he also showed me a letter from a neighbor on 25th Street who was very incensed about uh, nuisance behavior, illegal activity, drug selling and so forth that would appear to be coming from the shelter on that street. So hopefully we can get some answers about that tonight. And they also irradi irradiated their goals about having a more responsive system, building a relationship with management, and no more temporary, temporary. And we then had a meeting at DHS. Uh, Carlos was there, Ivan was there, Lori was there, as well as Aaron Drinkwater, Annabelle Palma. And uh, we talked, Miss Drinkwater talked about uh, the mayor's plan to get out of cluster housing get out of housing and hotels, and to open 90 shelters in New York City. She also provided the following statistics for District 38. Amounts are rounded. 700 total homeless, homeless housed in District 38. Of those, 500 are in hotels. 285 individuals from District 38 are housed in shelters across the city. Our district is a lower feeder. 
meaning it sends fewer than average into the shelter system. The ratio of homeless people per capita is average. And I will also read to you, all shelters and hotels being used as shelters have on-site caseworkers and security staff. Some shelters have specialties such as job preparedness, mental health, etc. All shelters either provide food or a means of preparing food. All shelter residents have an individual action plan. Residents are required to have productive activities during the day and there are curfews. These are the, the rules that DHS told me. And caseworkers meet with residents about every two weeks to check progress. And uh, that was that meeting. We all agreed to keep in touch. It was a very productive meeting and I think that's one of the reasons Lori has agreed to come here today and answer some of our questions. Uh, we later met with uh, Assemblyman Felix Ortiz. Yes. By the way, this is Barbara Lee, the co-chair. I apologize for being late. Hi. And uh, Felix it stressed the importance of keeping the lines of communication open between the community members and the management of the shelters, whether they're in hotels or full-fledged shelters. Uh, did you not, did you have anything you wanted to add to that about that meeting? Only that DHS decided not to show up for our appointment. Um, Sorry, which appointment was this? Excuse me? What appointment was this? With um, Assemblyman Ortiz. Um, we did not actually confirm that we would be able to make that, that appointment, so I'm happy to talk with you after about what happened there. But there was right. some so that was not Let's talk that. now. Okay, so, so that covers the chairperson's report. Um, next, I would like to invite Lori to speak and answer any questions. Uh, excuse me, if I have questions. You rattled off some numbers there. Mm -hmm. uh, and you said they were uh, for District 38. Yes. We are only concerned with uh, District uh, 7, Sunset Park. Uh, I would, uh, do you have a breakdown for Sunset Park? I do not. Uh, why not? <clears throat> there was not, that information was not available. I, I beg your pardon. Okay, so Lori. It is not collected by the city by community board? It, or community? It is. I'm sorry, Tom. These are the, the, the statistics I have. Right. They are su sufficient to gather information for tonight's meeting, and we're going to go on with the meeting, Tom. With so right ahead of the meeting, we just want to point out that it's insufficient for us to to uh, evaluate what's going on. Point taken. Can I ask a clarifying question? What encompasses District 38? Carlos? Sunset Park. Park, so, uh, Park. There's a, we're we're having Sunset. a discussion up here about data and information that is being presented today. Uh, I'm going to do two reminders and then I'm going to answer the question. One is we're taking information and questions from all of you. The things that can be answered today, we're going to be able to answer. The things we're not going to be able to answer, we're going we're to answer at a later time. Uh, so thank you for your patience. Second, I want to make sure that I answer the question about the District 38. District 38 encompasses all of Red Hook, all of Sunset Park, a uh, sliver of Borough Park, a little bit of Windsor Terrace, uh, and then we have a little bit of a panhandle in the 60s up to 16th Avenue in Bensonhurst. That's District 38. Uh, that is, uh, those are the data, that's the data that we have thus far. Uh, there is a question in the front as well to get CB7 numbers. And so the, that might, that might be data that I'll we have. Make it life I'm not. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. I'm not done. How many shelters so are there? Are out of order? Please. The things, the out of things order. that are important here are that we take back information and questions so that we can get the answers to them. The second thing is that we. Um, now I was gonna say something else about the data. Uh, we have data that say both the number of, of people that are being sheltered. In the, in the district, and then folks that are from Sunset Park that are being housed in the entire system. And those are two different uh, sets of data. We're gonna be asking those same questions for CP7. Ivan from my team is here as well. If you can, if you can raise your hand, Ivan. Ivan from my team is here as well, so he'll be jotting down any questions that you might have, and we can get back to you. Thank you so much. All right. Um Lori, I would like to introduce Lori Boozer from DHS to answer questions and can, yeah, or, yeah, that would be great, please. 
We're very grateful that DHS has come here tonight. Yeah, the mic is it's, on. It's kind of hard to hear. Okay, can you hear now? Yes, yes that's much better. Sorry, did you miss all my statistics? Shall I repeat them? No. Okay. Uh, this is Lori Boozer from DHS, Department of Homeless Services, and she's come here tonight to answer our questions. So does anyone have any questions? Uh, in the back, sir? Uh, what is the ratio of caseworker to the resident? So, does So that ratio might depend on each particular site. So I wouldn't be able to give you a generalized number because sites have different numbers of residents in the site. Um, so a range, maybe? I don't know how to give you a range that would be, I don't want to give you an inaccurate range, but for example, if a site has 200 <coughs> individuals versus a site that might have 60, the ratio of social workers at a site is going to be different. So, I mean, we're happy to, I can figure out for the sites in each community what the ratio might be. I know we have representatives here from Providence and Nicosia. Yes. So, actually, I'll start with Samaritan Village. Do you know for your site roughly what the ratio is? So we have 100, we're 150 bed male shelter, and we have six uh, case managers for all 150, plus two senior case managers to supervise the team, as well as a director of social services that supervises all social services. It's about one case manager per t anywhere between 22 to 28 clients. Um, sorry, and then for the other two shelter providers that are here, do you want to say what you have at your site? Yes. Yeah, I, I guess I should be more speaking because my shelter is right here next to Costco. So I have 39 females, 18 to 25 years old, and I have two case managers, plus a director of social services and an operations team. Plus we have career coordinators, aftercare coordinators, social workers, psychiatric nurse practitioners. We have a of Could people identify themselves whether they're asking a question or they're answering a question by name and affiliation so that we know who's the better idea of who's in the room, if it's possible? So just, this might be easier if the providers could actually come up. That way, if I need to pivot to you to answer any specific questions, um, I can just, we can just pass the mic and you can speak specifically about your sites. Uh, but just to give you just quick information, we underwent a model budgeting process where as an agency, we've been essentially trying to bring <laughs> across the board at all of our sites an equal level of service provision and so that is something that is currently happening so as we go through that process you'll see that sites are starting to be funded to have more and more availability of caseworkers and other resources that they may need um, just in recognition of previous years and ways in which sites may have operated and may have been under resourced so the agency is trying to course correct through the model budgeting process to make that level of service delivery more equitable across the system. Okay, in the back by the restroom, the <coughs> old restroom. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll move over. Um, I'm a homeowner in the neighborhood. And could you please tell us your name and yes. where you live? Yes, my name is Lee Chabowski. Thank you. And um, I'll admit that I'm here about the safety issues, but uh, setting that aside and keeping that a separate issue from. <coughs> um, do you have general ideas about what the community homeowners can do to help the homeless situation? Because I'm kind of uh, murky on that. Sure, thank you. I appreciate that question. I should have prefaced this by saying I actually live in this community board. So I live on 27th Street between 3rd and 4th Avenue. Um, right near the Brooklyn Way Hotel and the Dunkin' Donuts and the Seatown. And I think that one of the questions that we get a lot from community members because the process seems so mystical in terms of how you actually interact with shelters is how can communities assist. And so we actually have a system in place and we've been working on a system to develop partnerships with different communities. On a more local level, we have had situations if individuals have wanted to do clothing drives or toiletry, toiletry drives or to help to identify resources and things that shelters can 
uh, make use of and they can coordinate that work through my office and I can give you all my email address before I leave here tonight. So if you have an agency or a block association or any group of individuals looking to figure out a way to work with any of the sites, we're more than happy to facilitate opportunities for you to do that. We have tons of um, people do things every year. We've had churches. We actually did an event at our Bed Atlantic site over in um, over off of uh, Atlantic Avenue and we had the brothers of Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity come in, they cater lunch for them in there, they put together toiletry packages, they brought in uh, vendors to give clothing and shoes and they just fellowship with the men and really encourage them because um, I think sometimes it's giving but it's also the encouragement and developing relationships that can help to and help people to feel you know connected to community because I think part of what <coughs> we've tried to do with this plan is to help our residents to feel more connected with the community and not necessarily be the enemies or the bad guys moving into a community so any which way that we can work with the community to do that we're happy to figure that out with you. Uh, Lori, just one thing I just have a quick question myself if there's a security issue if people observe illegal or harassment type of behavior, what is the best procedure to get in contact with the person of that, the management of that shelter? So a couple of things, and I, I think I want to start this by saying that we're not an enforcement agency ourselves, neither are our providers. So if there is a crime that is actually being committed, irrespective of whether or not you know the person to be known to shelter or just someone in the community, our advice is always to call 911 so that NYPD can give the appropriate response to that. If, let's say, there's a person you happen to know is a client and you witness something um, that is disturbing but not necessarily criminal activity, we try to allow our providers to de develop systems and ways in which the community can reach out to them. So I think each of the providers can talk about how they interact with communities to, to connect about the clients. Sure. Um, good evening. My name is Mr. Nixon Pierre. I'm with Acacia Housing Network. Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Good. Um, the good thing about what you just indicated is that last week I met with Jeremy, I forgot your name. Miss Lee. Miss Lee and the Mr. Felix um, at his office. And what we came up with, I provided my number first and foremost as the go to person for my organization. In addition to that, I gave them numbers to each one of my buildings. I manage five buildings. So they have the 24 7 number to that particular building in the event that they may see, hear something, they can call directly. Depending on the time, my staff can reach out to me. As a matter of fact, as late as 1047, I received a call. <laughs> last night. Uh, so we are very responsive. I think that was a good move because not only that, it helps to sort of reduce the resources that a police department will provide. So we serve as a buffer. No problem, I facilitate you. Um, so we do serve as a buffer in that manner. And this is how we first, not first, but this is how we engage with the community, at least to minimize those things. For us at Turning Point, we have been in, I can speak up. For us at Turning Point, we've been in this community since the 80s. And the shelter on 3rd Avenue has been here since 1990. So we've had instances where um, businesses have come to us because they recognize one of our residents and they've come to us and said they've caused some kind of disturbance and it's good to build rapport. So we give our business cards to this business and just recently we had somebody go and have an argument with one of the store owners and wreck the store. DHS is really good with um, allowing us, if this person is somebody who is problematic, it, it's about building the relationships with communities. So if this person has caused problems in the area that we can't fix um, by mediating or trying to build some kind of um, bridge for this client, because remember, we're in this to help the clients. That's what this is about. So I have young girls, 18 to 25 year olds, so there can be some mischief happening. So I've even had to go inside of the sex shops because some of the girls have stolen things out of there and broke windows and stuff like that. So we have availed ourselves to the community. Chinese restaurant on 34th and, and 4th, 
Um, one of our girls went in there and knocked down stuff. They called us up, they stopped delivering. We went over there, myself and my operations manager. We talked to them and we gave our business cards. So we have made those bridges between businesses and the shelter to make sure that when those instances happen, they have somebody to reach out to. Yeah, we do pretty similar. Any complaints or residents from houses or residents in the building, they can come over or they can call me. Hi. Um, we also. Not a yeller. It might have stretch all the way down there. Can you can you come on? Be efficient. Use the podium. <laughs> Hello, Tom Caesar from Samaritan Village, and um, like like my colleague said, like basically we go out there, I try and touch base with all businesses that are there, let them know where I'm from, and if they have any concerns, and can say that they're clients from my residence, then we'll definitely look into it and, and follow up with the clients. Um, on a good note, you know, I haven't had situations where our clients are. Um, doing anything of criminal activity that has come to my attention. I also connect with the um, 72nd Precinct and they keep me apprised of it and things that may come from my shelter. But again, we've been relatively low incident. Um, but anyone can come and we give them, if someone comes directly to my shelter, we'll give them the phone number to the site that they can always call and I'll respond to the whatever it is. And in addition to that, if anyone reaches out, so normally the Intergovernmental Affairs team for the agency has borough directors that manage each of the boroughs. We typically have a Brooklyn borough director. I manage that team. We don't have a person in that seat um, currently. But in the interim, if you are unable to reach any of the providers and you want to reach out directly to us or to the community board to contact us or to the council member, we also receive constituent issues from the community that we will work with the provider, with the elected official to try to find a response to. So I think that, you know, just want to drive home that under the, this new plan, we're really trying to figure out strategically with the community how we can collectively be in partnership and be more responsive to the concerns that are raised. Uh, Jeremy? So I appreciate that statement. I'm Jeremy Laufer. I'm, I'm the district manager for the community board. Uh, but that's just a statement. Could you tell us how that corresponds to DHS's policy not to communicate with community boards or elected officials or anybody else when opening a homeless shelter in a, in a community? Brooklyn Way, for example, we got less than 24 hours notice after I had been asking DHS for three weeks whether a shelter was opening there. I was lied to for three weeks. What is DHS's responsibility to the communities that host these facilities? So, with traditional shelter facilities that are not hotels, we've committed to giving a minimum of 30 days notification in advance of a shelter opening in the community, which we have adhered to for any of the new shelters that are opening in community. In most instances, we've actually been able to give even more notice than 30 days. When it comes to hotels, those are used in emergency situations. And so we can only notify at the point that we know that we're going to go into a hotel. So for context, New York City is a right to shelter city, meaning that on any given night, we have hundreds of individuals who come into our intake facilities, either at 30th Street or at PATH. And we, by law, are obligated to house those individuals in a shelter facility. If we do not have a traditional shelter bed available, we have to turn to hotel capacity to fill that gap. And so part of the reason why this plan was developed is to try to build the shelter capacity that we need so that we can actually end our use of hotels and clusters. And so that is sort of the trade-off that you're seeing in communities. So as we open new facilities, we're working to try to close hotels and to hopefully not have to use them. Our use of hotels has been happening from as far back as the Lindsay administration. And so if you can imagine, this system has roughly 60,000 individuals in it, plus whatever comes in or cycles in and out on a given day. And so by law, we have to have a place to place those individuals. Follow up, please. Because Follow I don't believe my question was answered. My question is, why is the community given less than 24 hours notice? For example, Brooklyn Way Hotel. For three weeks, people were asking me. For three weeks, people noticed DHS going into the hotel. But DHS kept telling me, oh no, we, we're not negotiating a contract with them. So I lied to my constituents because I shared what DHS shared with me. So why does DHS have a policy of giving us less than 24 hours notice? 
we notify when we know that we need to use a particular hotel. So once we have that information, that's when we're able to notify the community. My constituents okay. notified me three weeks before. All right, listen, I'm going to go. I have a question here, then I'm going to get you in the back. Okay, well, I have a couple of questions. One, um, I live in seven, my name is Barbara, and I live at 744th Avenue. That's um, 24th and 4th Avenue. So I'm right by um, facility 235 24th Street. When that facility opened up, it was never a hotel. <coughs> Maybe a name, but as soon as it was open, it was a shelter. And we weren't informed about it. And then when it was opened up, there was no security. I know that 30 years ago, I was in a shelter and we had curfews and we were supposed to, are you paying attention to me? Are you just ringing? No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, 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 the address of the hotel is where you're referring okay. to. Okay, so the thing is that, you know, when I was in a shelter, we had curfew. The only time that um, we were, they would get, let us slide, say if I had to work at night, I would have to tell them I'm working at night. So they would say, okay, you can come in after curfew, as long as you get that. People have been hanging out. They're, they're not like, oh, coming from work and just, you know, casually talking full of their, they're out all night. Sometimes past a you know, 12 o'clock at night. I work. When I want to go to sleep, I can't because they're hanging out, smoking and drinking and stuff. Mm -hmm. Now, I want to have a good relationship with um, other residents in this neighborhood. I know what it's like to be homeless and live in a shelter and like want, you know, I know that need and how it feels and how people look at me and say like, oh, she's a homeless person. I understand and I know that, you know, they're not, but a few bad apples make it really bad for everybody else. And then when we don't get help from the facility or for DHS, and they just feel like, oh, well, they're there. There's nothing we can do about it. The police say they can't do anything about it. You say you can't do anything about it. The providers say they can't do that. So it's just like these people have free reign, and we're just like the victims of that. It's not fair. So the question is for if you see someone outside of a hotel, what is it that is done about that? Is that the question? Because the, re the response that I would give you is that, well, that, that's perfectly fine, but the response that I'll give you is that it's not the case that we would say that we can't do anything about it or that we wouldn't do anything about it. I've not ever given that response to any community, and I think that if, even if it's a hotel site, if there are individuals who are identified as our clients, then our conversation with providers is always, let's identify who our clients are, let's re-engage them to bring them back inside the facility, and let's figure out, either through case conference or whatever needs to happen, how we work with this individual. And in situations where it's extreme and we cannot so potentially work with a person, then we have room to transfer individuals into other facilities, right? And so it would not be the case that we wouldn't respond. Now, does that mean people won't continue to be outside? I'm outside, I mean, people go outside. And so it is challenging sometimes to to continue to bring those individuals in and not all the individuals are individuals from our sites. But it's different and when they're hanging out, they're not allowed to hang out in front of the hotel. So they'll hang out in front of my building. Mm -hmm. So I, so I suffer because of that. And the thing is, mm -hmm. the other thing I wanted to ask is like, do you provide any community space where and these people have <coughs> kids? So I understand the kids need to do um, hang out, socialize, and everything. Like, do you provide spaces, community space where they can? You know, hang out, socialize. Yeah. It, it depends on the facility. So I'll let each provider talk about what their facilities have. All right, so I would like to address that situation because the building that uh, you were talking about is my building that I manage. It's the Howard Johnson Greenwood on 24th Street. Um, let's, let's look at it from this perspective. Everything that you were saying, I do understand. There are certain things I don't agree with, but I understand, first and foremost. Um, the way your building is situated, the entrance to your building is on 4th Avenue. Right. The entrance to the hotel is on 24th, right? Right. One second, please. Mm -hmm. um, I believe you reside on the 3rd or the 4th floor? 3rd floor. 3rd floor. Mm -hmm. So we are talking about a window around where the hotel is. Yeah. So noise traffic. We can all agree with that. Now, when you talk about they are in 
front of your building. They, they are not really in front of your yes, building. They are. They hang out on the because the entrance, my building. because the entrance they of your building is on Fourth Avenue. That is part of my building. That is like our building. They huh? hang out. Well, I'm, gonna, I'm okay. going to address it piece by piece, okay? okay? Like I said, I understand where you're coming from. I just may not agree with certain things. So the entrance to your building is on 24th. There is a stoop around the corner, right, that has no entrance to the building. That is sealed off. That is part of our building. No, I'm not, I'm, ma'am, okay. I'm not disagreeing with okay. you, right? I'm just painting a picture okay. so folks can have a better understanding of what you were saying, right? So around the corner, there are a few steps that leads to nothing, that is attached to your building. Yes. I have seen clients there before. Mm -hmm. my, my organization have managed that hotel from last July. We took over from another provider, right? And the first thing the hotel management informed us about is that very same situation. So that was one of the first thing, first house meeting that I had with the residents that's there. So they are, and they will continue to be fully aware that that portion is off limits, whether it's that portion or on the other side, because that building nestles between a residential area. We have houses on both sides. So the clients from that building, 90%, I will say, do not go on that stoop. Why? That stoop is open also to the public. So some, some of the people that you may see there may not necessarily belong to the shelter, okay? I'm not saying that people from the shelter haven't been there, or sometimes they are there, but we have to put everything in context. I've lived in that building for 30 years. I think I know who my neighbors are. <laughs> I, I'm not disagreeing with you. However, there are so many shelters. I just found out three weeks ago that the, the, the hotel next to the grocery is a shelter. So I'm not saying what you're saying is absolutely wrong. But let's put that. it in context. I Sometimes it's not I always I I shelter that. residents. Right. So some people from your shelter, and it also is the people coming from Brooklyn Way that come over and hang out. But what we do at Acacia, what we do, we do have security, mm -hmm. right? We used to have FJC, now we have Sarah Security. They make rounds. And if they see somebody there, whether it's from the shelter or not, whether they're able to identify or not, they have a conversation. Just like last night when you called me, I said, no problem, I'll take care of it, let me make a phone call. That's what we do. That's how we work together with the community. Okay? No problem. Thank you. I'm going to go to some other questions. I'll get you next, but right now, you back in the back. Um, I wish to I own say your name. And my name is Selma Abdallah. I've been living in the neighborhood for 43 years, and this is my mother. She's a homeowner. Um, I wish our only problem was um, just hanging out. But there obviously have been a lot of break-ins in the neighborhood. We live directly across from Brooklyn Way, the entrance where the um, homeless shelter <coughs> is. And um, about a few weeks, about two weeks ago, there was a break-in in one of our neighbor's home. Um, someone was pushing the door open while the owner was actually holding it and calling the police. That same night, someone knocked and rang my mom's doorbell. And he was trying to get in, but my mom did not open the door. So we want to know, first of all, what you guys are doing about, you said you were in law enforcement? So, no, I'm not where's the law enforcement? There's a department of police officer here. Perhaps I, I, I can't believe you guys did not even think of putting a police officer on that block, on that, on that entrance way, when you guys know that there are children on that block. There are many children on the back. Number, that's number one. Number two, I want to go back to what he said earlier. We were not notified. We were not, you, you guys knew a month before because we were told by someone that worked in that hotel that someone, that you guys were bringing in a homeless shelter. One month before they came in and we called, we called the counseling's office. <laughs> Some people get called you. You guys would not answer our questions. One month before they started coming in. So you guys did know. You guys did know. One month, we had someone, because we are a very friendly neighborhood, the street, we all grew up together. There's grandchildren, we, I know grandchildren. People have been living there for years, 43 years, I'm telling you. We, we spoke, we talked to the, to the workers there. They told us a month before you guys settled them in, and we were calling, and no one answered our calls. So two things. 
I'm sorry that those incidents happened. I don't know offhand if those individuals were homeless individuals from the Brooklyn Way. I don't know if NYPD can confirm that. Mm -hmm. But I can't I say. Like NYPD is doing anything. Well, I'm not. I don't not speak for NYPD. NYPD but what I will happen. say is that it, you know okay. we're going to make generalized assumptions that when a crime happens, they're happening there happening from the individuals. There is an increase of crime. From we have the never been afraid like in the way we are now. 43 years, we have never been afraid well, like you, we are right now. You should speak to NYPD about the increase NY, in crime. We tried to call. But I'm not here to answer for them, okay, so they're so in the back. I'm not, I mean, I cannot answer for what's happening with crime in your district. My sister here is protecting the city. What are you guys doing for us? Okay, so first and foremost, I want to invite uh, uh, the best way. your name, sir? I'm sorry. Okay. Deputy Inspector. Deputy Inspector Emmanuel Gonzalez, been the CEO for the, of the 72nd Precinct for two and a half years. Most, if not everyone here, uh, knows me uh, from one way or another. Uh, meetings, uh, I actually have had uh, individuals in this room in my office. I've actually invited uh, Caesar, has been to the crime analysis uh, office in the precinct and seen our capabilities there. So with that said, uh, looking at crime analysis, <coughs> in regards to homeless shelters. And I'm inviting anybody on the board, on both boards, to come to the precinct and we can do the same thing that I did with Caesar and we can look at the statistics. And right now, there is no correlation between any homeless shelter in any of the neighborhoods, in any of the sectors, and crime. Um, I would say there is an increase on 26th Street. With and I, and I, I, I yeah. can, I'll invite anyone from the board mm -hmm. and we'll look at your address and we have great capabilities. One of the things that we have is uh, called the DOS light uh, system. And I love the system and one of these, if you're, we have really innovative stuff and one of the things I like about it is because I get to see where I'm a taxpayer myself and I get to see where my tax dollars are. And this particular uh, system is able to form a radius on any location and we can look at the crime activity, the reported <coughs> crime activity within that within that area. So I'm um, just if if, if I, we I can. I would like to say that in one week or two weeks, there have been two break-ins, actually three break-ins, two in one the same car and one van, one of the of the um, the businesses in that in that on 26th Street and okay. a break-in in the home. And we can sure look at those break-ins, and I'll get. And police were involved. And I have, like, and, but they would never follow up. Okay, I'm going to take another question. Oh, I have one more question. Um, <coughs> sex offenders. Are there sex offenders living across from us? That's, I well, there's, that a, children? there's a directory you can look at, but I really... But we don't know the names. This is a meeting about homelessness. Right. So I was told I was I was told to come here to um, address my concerns. Well, let me give you a direct answer so, for my you. shelters, mm -hmm. right? Like I indicated earlier, um, I run five buildings. And my population is what is called FWCs, families with children. Mm -hmm. so, so you will not be able to be in my, organ my program at all. So who's in charge of Brooklyn Way? They're not here. No, that's, they're not here. They're not here? That's Can I get it? No. I'm with Acacia Housing Network. Oh, I want to know who's on Brooklyn Way. I'm I'm concerned, actually, I'm concerned you're the one on 24th as well, because those people come along our way, too. And you were sure they are coming from? They come, yes. Okay. And they actually go to my brother's business well, on 23rd Street, too. I can answer the question. Mr. Jeremy has yeah. our telephone numbers. He can provide it to you. It's okay. not a problem. So what are we going to do about the crime? If I'd like we, can to have a first we do have to get to some other questions, though. In the back, please. Tell us your name and where I'm you live. Karen West. I live on 33rd Street. And I noticed that it is a plethora of housing in a very limited space, which I believe creates a problem. I think it should have been negotiated a little better, that's just my opinion. But my question is, and this is what's been bothering me, I see two things happening. I see the people in the hotels, and I wonder what services are the people in the hotels receiving every day? Are they being just tossed out on the street every day? Because it's kind of looking like that to me, that they have nothing to do and they have no, no program. You know what I mean? I, I would like to see people That's a very good question. the program. And the second part of that question is we also now have a, a large amount of homeless people, I don't know where they're coming from, they're coming from probably our own neighborhoods. 
and I mean on my corner, I know directly of the man who lives on the corner now. And do we have any kind of community, like drop-in center, or any place like this where these people who refuse to go into facilities can be serviced and helped? You, you, you ask three major questions. I can answer the first, because the other two are quite general, and maybe DHS can talk about those other two. However, on 33rd Street between 4th and 3rd Avenue is the BPM, beats per minute. Mm -hmm. I manage that building. Mm -hmm. That building, it's not 100% shelter. The hotel does have their regular guest that comes in and out. So perception, perception, you may think everybody is, is, is um, everyone are, are homeless coming out of that shelter. It can be regular guests. What I would love to do, as I got told Mr. Jeremy last week, to invite you to either one of our house meetings with the clients or with the families or one of my staff meetings with the staff. But do you have something in place for the people who are your clients? That's so so when you come to the meeting or come to meet us, we will tell you the service we provide, we will introduce the case manager, housing specialist, now, sir, employment specialist. All of us want to hear you. Yeah. No problem. I can, I can further this discussion individually after. It's not a problem. I'm not here. I'm not going anywhere. We'd like to hear it now, sir. Okay. No problem. So all, that, so excuse me. I'll recognize people who have questions. I'm, I'm, I'm We've got to keep a that. certain amount of but order in the meeting. About it. Oh, so I can, I can add in. I'm actually okay. on 29th Street. I'm not around this area, but I do run for 150 bed employment shelter. So I can say that from day one, a client gets a full assessment. Within 24 hours, we do a full assessment on both um, immediate needs, what you need, whether it's medical, whether it's um, a referral to get your, your documentation or ID. So we do that from day one. On day two, because that's usually at night, on day two they meet with our case management team and we further find out what's going on with the individual, with the situation, family, employment and housing. Within 10 days you get a full assessment. So our employment shelter, either you're working, you're working towards gaining employment, or you have employment and you're working towards moving out and finding an apartment. From day one, that's the goal. We meet with our clients every at least every two weeks to make sure they're following steps to get that goal. Services can include resume writing, cover letter building, um, showing someone how to dress for an interview, how to you know, speak on an interview, um, going out on interviews with individuals. That's all geared towards employment. So they're just not there, not doing anything. They know this from day one, that we're an employment shelter. And if they don't, because we can't force everyone to do this, but we work closely with DHS to say, hey, we're an employment shelter. This guy's not finding work. This person's not doing anything to find work or get IDs needed. Maybe this isn't the best place for him. So that's just a small snippet of some of the stuff we saw. Sure, and just to add for clarification, so all of our clients receive what's called an individual living plan. So when they come into our system, they are assessed from the door. Um, they're assessed when they go to a particular site to identify what their needs are, what services they will need to have in place because our ultimate goal is going to be rehousing. And so as an agency, what we're trying to do is essentially provide the clients with the tools that they would need to be able to go out into the community to find permanent housing. Just to sort of make clear for clarification, we recently streamlined our voucher program into one program so that our clients can have hopefully a little bit of an easier time working with landlords to accept vouchers. We've also developed a source of income discrimination unit at HRA to again combat our landlords who are not willing to accept vouchers because under the law in New York, that's a violation of um, under the human rights code so we're doing a number of different things so anytime a client comes into our sites they are assessed and we're working with our providers the providers are working with the teams that they have on site to make sure the individuals have some sort of wraparound services to get them back into permanent housing and just and that can vary by site depending on the population so there may be an employment site versus a families with children site so depending on the population that may drive the needs of the services at that particular site but there's no communal drop-off, drop-in place. So I actually am trying to check that. We don't have one. So unfortunately, a lot of our drop-in centers were closed under the Bloomberg administration. So we don't have one that I think is near to what the location that you're talking to. But I think certainly, I know this community board has a siting committee. Or a, at least I... 
it's the school board. Oh, oh well, if if there is a if there is a need for a drop in, and you want to work with us to try to figure out how to make that happen, I think we're open to having that conversation as an agency. Okay, thank you, Miss. Right here. Yes, uh, the notice said to uh, please say your name and where you live. Oh, I'm um, Maria. I live on uh, 45th Street. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, um, yeah, I noticed that like the lady was saying in the back about the hotels, hotels that are uh, somewhat like the fancy hotel on 39th Street. Part of it is for uh, the programs in there. Part of it's regular people. And some people are coming from Florida, from other states. Why aren't those states taking care of they, And I asked them, were you, were you, were, I'm in a special program, a special program. I'm wondering why the other states are sending people. Another girl was walking around saying she was from Pennsylvania. I didn't know what to send. Yeah, those are people paying the hotels yeah. to stay there. Like yeah. you can, like the Brooklyn, I, I think the BPM is still accepting regular, you can go on, uh, so yeah, we, so just to be clear, when, when we're in a hotel, it doesn't necessarily mean that we are occupying an entire hotel. No, no, there no, are still floors, going to be floors, floors in the hotel with regular people. <laughs> sure. So I, I'm just trying to clarify that there will, can also be travelers or visitors or patrons of the hotels in these hotels. Our clients would just be the, no different from an individual who's renting a hotel room. That you, you have to understand, as she was saying earlier, about the right to shelter law. I have clients that come from the Netherlands to shelter here in Sunset Park. We cannot deny them. DHS cannot, if they come here for shelter, they have to house them because of the right to shelter law. So oh, you meet those people from Florida. Those people, like Florida. So just to be clear, I want to, I, I, I wish I could recall the exact statistic. The percentage of individuals in our system is like, it's like, two percent like one percent like it's a there's a very low it's a myth that individuals are coming from all these other states to take advantage of the homeless system that is actually not true now what we do see are individuals who are street homeless who have traveled from out of town and are on the street and they may contribute to a street homelessness issue and we engage them in a very particular way but most of the individuals in our system are New York City residents and part of the intake process requires us to essentially look at the last known address to make sure that there's some sort of city residency um, that they are connected to and in fact to figure out if there's a way to intercede to keep them in the, the apartment that they came from. So either working with family members to help pay rent or trying to figure out if we can intercede in an eviction or in a housing court case to prevent an eviction, right? And so in that assessment process, we're looking at addresses. So if someone does come from Florida, there are going to be a whole bunch of questions about what's happening in Florida. We're going to call Florida, right? And so there's a process. We're not just trying to house people just for the sake of housing them. We have to house under the law, but we also do look at last known addresses to see if there's any way to keep individuals in their homes. Sylvia, your name and where you live, please. My name is Sylvia, and I live on 39th Street. I have a couple of things. One of them, um, in regards to the showers that Turning Point used to offer, mm -hmm. that is very much in need in this community. Um, I, I can't even tell you how important it is for them to have a place to shower, especially the people that, are, that don't have the shelters, that are walking in the streets. And it's really dear to my heart. I ended up making a whole brochure for the homeless because one person came into our church looking for a place to shower and I have a, a place where they could go for NA meetings, AA meetings, uh, where they could get food, but there's nothing for them to shower. Um, um, I know they're making a bus. Yes. Like for 10 months, for 10 months now, the bus is about another year away. We're waiting for the actual launch. It's going to be a portable bus. We're going to have three showers on the bus, and it's going to be stationed here in Sunset Park. Um, those of you who don't know, Turning Point did an, a strategic alliance with Brooklyn Community Services. So our main office is no longer located on 52nd and 4th where it used to be. It's now on 285 Skillmore Street, and part of that alliance caused us to dissolve some of the programs that we had. But um, Eric Adams was able to um, uh, grant us money so that we could get a shower bus because just like it's near and dear to your heart, that was one of the essential programs 
of Turning Point so we understand the need for it. And it will be back. When it will be back, I can't guarantee another you. Another year. Yeah, it's, it's probably going to be another year. I'm not going to lie. It's probably going to be another year. Wow. So the next thing is, yes, there are child molesters. And there is one that was noted on November 28th of 2016 in the shelter of the Comfort Inn at 353 38th Street. There's an article in the Brooklyn Daily. The reporter was Caroline Spivak. I have the phone number and it was November 28th. He was living at that shelter in Comfort Inn and there was families in there and he is a child molester and that's there, 38th Street and 4th, between 3rd and 4th. You have the public school, elementary school, PS24, up the block right up the block. Five schools within a thousand feet. Yep. Five schools. You have the, no the, the, the high school, the middle school, the, 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 the school across the street. I mean, the, the other school on 37th Street. We can't have that happen. And then that same location, just three months ago, Somebody that was living there broke into somebody else's house on 36th Street between 4th and 5th Avenue between 11 and 12 o'clock at night, broke the glass in, and he lived in that, built that comfort in at 353 38th Street. And this, there is stuff happening in our neighborhood. <coughs> Why the police department is not acknowledging that, I have an issue with. I okay. think it's very let's important. Let, let's let the gentleman answer and then I'll ask the police to comment. So I cannot answer pre July of 2017. Okay? So in, in reference to what you indicated three months ago, I do not know anything about that. Okay. And a year and almost two years ago. Once again, I cannot year. answer yeah. pre July of 2017. We, Acacia, took over Sorry. July 1st, 2017. And did the police have any information about that? So I just need a little attitude so I can frame my, my answer here. Okay. So I can't speak of specifics because I just don't have that capability right here to answer specifically. And I don't need an address. Maybe we can get it by the end of the, the meeting and I have my officer call down the crime analysis office. But I just want to make this clear. We do have a crime analysis office. They work independently of the precinct. They work for, for one police plaza and they are the best at this. And we have sat down on several occasions, myself and the chairman, in regards to crime and the correlation between homeless shelters and crime. And it just doesn't exist. I know that these that crime is happening, but the, the fact that we're that I'm sitting here and listening and people are insisting that somehow there are correlations between the homeless shelter and the crime that's happening in the neighborhood is just not factually true. And I just want to invite the board again to come down to the crime analysis uh, section in the precinct and we can sit down and look at those statistics. Thank you. I'm going to call on Jeremy, then Maria, and then Cesar. So I have the information on that. I'd be happy to share later. But there was a comment made which I don't want to let stand, which uh, I don't even remember who said it, and it doesn't matter who said it, but somebody said, uh, the, the homeless or the regular people? Yeah. yeah. Homeless or regular, regular people. people? I just want to like make that. sure exactly. we all yeah. are on the same page about that. All right. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. Who did I say next? Maria, I yeah, think, Maria, and then Cesar. Good evening. Uh, I'm Maria Roca. I'm the president and uh, founder of Princess of the Park, volunteers in the neighborhood who initially organized to advocate for the park uh, 25, 25 years ago. We all know if you've spent three hours in this community and went to look at the beautiful, iconic view from 6th Avenue, that the park is a hub of, for people who do not have a place to go, be that morning or noon. It is a beautiful place. You could even sleep there on a summer night and have a wonderful time. Really? However, if you are there, because you have no other place to go, and you are not well fed, and you don't have the appropriate clothing, and the appropriate uh, support of a family or friends, or a job, that is a, a different situation. We know, and it's coming from City Hall, it doesn't come from NYPD, 
that there has been an attitude in the city for a number of years now to turn away from quality of, of life crimes. What has it, if, I don't want to take everybody's time because I would assume that a lot of people here know, know, know what it is, to not arrest people basically for hanging out or for drinking in the park or for urinating, defecating, and anything that is called antisocial behavior. But rather, maybe hand them a ticket, a, a desk um, appearance, uh, appearance ticket. ticket, thank you. And many of those folks walk around without identification for a variety of reasons. Sometimes they don't even know how to get to motor vehicles and get a non-driver's ID. I am a mystified, and that's the nicest word that I can use in public, by this attitude that people who are in need, people who are having trouble get, getting from today to tomorrow, are expected to come somewhere to seek help. You go to people. If you've taken one semester of social work, sorry, the first thing they teach you, meet your client where they are. Wait, wait, Emotionally, the question? Well, I, it, this is the psychologically and physically. The no, part is sitting like there that. with dozens, dozens and maybe hundreds at any given day of people in our community living here who need help, who need to be supported in a variety of ways so that they then don't go outside of the park, which is what they're going to do, and maybe bother a lot of people or create other. So, the shower, what is it? Fifth Avenue is sitting there. What if it never saw it? Now you said you lost it because of some, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't the right hand wasn't talking it to wasn't the a bus. It was a building where we used to shower. Oh, I thought I had been told the bus, bus was coming. <laughs> oh. A year and plus time to do that when we know. <coughs> who else has a bus? We want to know. Who else has buses in the city of New York? I think I know the answer, but it's a rhetorical question. Who else has okay. food? No, Maria, not, no, 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 please. Food that comes, basic food. They are here. They are among us in many ways that sometimes they are our relatives. They are our ex-neighbors. I'm, I'm agreeing with you, but you need to ask and all of that. But we, this the idea of dividing the police department the has this piece of it, and they cannot cross the street to then talk to the other. The other agency has this piece of it. The other agency has this piece of it. This gentleman cannot answer about what happened in 2017 because he was, didn't have the contract for Acacia in 2017. But you left the answer halfway. Who did have the Contract. Okay, yes, I'm going to ask the, the officer to answer sense. the question about the uh, the standard of living, the quality of life issues, and the laws regarding that, and how you're enforcing that. So the uh, park. You really brought up a good point about the park. The park is uh, a particular problem. Uh, we've actually increased our arrest, and we can go back to the crime analysis office, and we can see up. 200% in arrests in the park, well over 300% since, since I've been the CEO of the 7-2 in regards to summonses and quality of life issues in the park. There are particular problems in the park. However, when we go back to what, what exactly who is homeless and who's not, many of these individuals that are drinking in the park are not necessarily homeless. There are there are residents. There are everyday residents within Sunset Park. We have been enforcing park regulations, and it's actually easier for us to enforce the park regulations because they are regulations. There are park regulations. It becomes challenging when we talk about the situation that the, this young man is talking about uh, in regards to just hanging out. You know, you're talking about challenging issues in regards to constitutionality of how, what an officer can do to tell somebody, hey, don't hang out in front of this building, but you're allowed to hang out in front of that building. So that's very challenging 
for the officers in New York City. We do have a 311 system, and I invite everyone to use the 311 system. If you have a disorderly group and somebody is hanging out in front of your stoop and is not necessarily welcome there, please call 911. Excuse me, 311. So I just want to clarify something about the park. Um, and then generally street homelessness and to sort of echo what the officer, said, the officer said about who is homeless. We've had this conversation with the council member and with the ad hoc committee and to acknowledge that there is a lot of activity in the park and I think unfortunately what happens with homelessness in this city and in most cities is that there is a conflation of drug activity and alcohol activity and most often crime with homelessness. And so we have expressed it to the council member we're willing to partner with any agency in the city to help the communities address these issues even if the individual is not homeless right and so what we've often found is that with the increase in use of heroin and fentanyl a lot of people who are appearing to be street homeless are actually individuals who have homes who have places to go but because they are engaged in drug behavior they are sleeping in parks or sleeping in places where um, they might appear to be homeless but might not necessarily be homeless. However, with that said, if you think that someone is homeless and in need of services, you can also use the 311 system to try to get services to that individual. And so if you use the 311 app or you call 311 and you say, I see someone in the park, I think that they may be homeless, we will deploy a street outreach team to that location to engage this individual to try to assess them and connect them with services. Now one thing you have to understand with an individual who is street homeless, it is not the case that we engage them and they agree to come inside. Oftentimes, it will take multiple points of contact with that individual to earn their trust, to build a relationship. Going back repeatedly, repeated, re repeatedly, it could take weeks, it could take months, it could take years. And you can see this individual. Many of our street homeless individuals are known to us. They are known to the community. And we spend a lot of time trying to work with them to bring them in to a facility. And that is a process. And so we're happy to talk further about the park situation, I know we mentioned this in our meeting, and figuring out if it's harm reduction, if there are other agencies that we need to bring to the table with NYPD, with the council member to have that conversation, we're happy to be a part of that. So like, we can follow up after this meeting to see how we make that happen. Thank you. So right now the meeting is over time, so I'm going to try and get all your questions in. Uh, I know, uh, just please try to make it quick. And Cesar, I promised I'd let yeah, you speak so, next. So a couple of things. You know, I, I, that was the first thing that I was going to say. We are at, at over an hour, and, and we want to respect people's time. Um, so there's a couple of things. Um, first of all, thank you all for coming today. And thank you, Council Member Menchak, for sticking around. Um, there are a lot of things that are going on. A lot of things are coming up. And there is no right or wrong answer. People don't have right, right or wrong perspectives. Everybody has a perspective. Now, a, a couple of things. In terms of all of, this, uh, uh, all of these comments around crime that, that are coming up, I, I want to publicly make a commitment that in the next several weeks, we will call a public safety committee. We'll have the, captain, uh, the deputy inspector come in. And, and I want to encourage you all to come back and engage with us about crime. Because there is no denying I was a victim of crime very recently. There is no denying that there is crime in the community. Okay, so that's 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 one thing. The other thing, uh, again, I, I want us to open up our hearts and our minds around creating and finding solutions, not just to the quality of life issues that affect us, folks who are a little bit more fortunate and have a home and have a roof over our heads, but the folks that we're talking about here tonight, right? So that's 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 the other thing, and so. Um, you know, I think the good news is, is that, you know, this is an opportunity for all of us. And again, I'm so grateful that the council member is here because this is an opportunity for all of us to double down on how to make local government work for us and how to find solutions for these very tough issues. They're extremely tough. And I want to reiterate. It, because part of what I do for a living uh, rubs up against homelessness. People don't choose to become homeless. And, and so I think I'm so encouraged by folks who are making, who are asking questions about what kind of services are we offering homeless people? What else can we do as homeowners to help homeless folks? I mean, that's super encouraging. That is like the bright side 
of, of coming together and, and maybe there's a little tension in the room right now because it, it, it's affecting us all in different ways. But again, the good news is, is that if we continue to engage and, 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 and try to have a, a positive outlook around what we can do as local folks with our local government, I think there's a lot of, of ground that we can cover. So, so again, let's, let's re-engage on this. I, um, I think uh, you know, Deputy Inspector has been super open to, to engaging us and to, I'm sure to engage anyone in the community to really understand how they manage crime and, and what resources and capabilities they have. So I'll okay. let, I'll, I'll give you yeah, we're good, the discretion. We're going over time. we got a couple of quick questions. The officer, then. Just, just 30 seconds. And just, my crime analysis office is going to be open until uh, 830. So if, right after the meeting, if anybody from the board uh, would like to go to the precinct, I'll, I'll take a ride over there with, with them and we'll sit down and we'll look at the uh, crime analysis and we'll look at the computer system. And I just wanted, I'll be remiss if I didn't say that, you know, uh, Councilman Carlos Menchaca has also come down to the office and look at these statistics as well, as, as well as uh, Assemblyman uh, Felix Ortiz has come down. So anyone from the board, please come down to the precinct and we can sit down and look at these uh, statistics. And you're right, Cesar, there is crime, w whether the, the homeless uh, shelters are, are responsible for that. That's we just haven't found a bit of a correlation there. Thank you. Okay, I'll take a couple more quick questions. The men, okay. gentleman on my left here. My name is Jairo Figueroa. I live in 36th Street. Um, I'm also a pastor at uh, Christian mm -hmm. Church. And I'm responding to Sylvia out there. Uh, we're working with two other churches, uh, Bay Ridge Christian uh, Center and Sunset Park Community Church. And we saw the problems that we have uh, with homeless. Uh, we feed them on Saturday morning, it's at 9 o'clock. And we built four showers in, in the premises there. So, you know, it's something that is not for profit. And uh, we use the volunteers from the different churches. And that's why we are able to switch them. And uh, we have different resources for them. We also work with the pantry that Bay Ridge provides, where we also give them food and, um, and clothing. The only problem that we are having is that there's medical attention, that there's certain things that we cannot do. And some of these homeless are uh, uh, illegal uh, immigrants. Undocumented. Yeah, undocumented. So, you know, we, we have that problem. We want to do more, but we can't. So if anybody has a, a response, and not just a response, some type of solution to start, solve some of those problems. We also have also American citizens that come in and, and you know, they, they all need that. So in response to that, and uh, the question will be, you know, what can we do uh, to help some of these undocumented uh, individuals? Okay. So can anyone answer that? Quickly? Can I answer that? Because we, we have, Turning Point has exactly what he's looking for. And with the young lady that asked, who's going into the parks? Who, Turning Point is going into the parks. We have an outreach team that goes into Sunset Park, and we look for those individuals. But like someone else up there said, they have to trust us. So we keep going into the park, and yes, they see that we give out condoms, we, we give out information, we invite them to come in for something to eat to our other location on 39th Street. So we are going out to the park, our outreach teams are going out there to meet the people where they are, to gain their trust and bring them, and link them to care, whether it be medical care, or whatever they need. And not only the documented, we are also helping the undocumented. So, and we're not asking any questions, we're not calling anybody, we're bringing them in if they need medical care, or uh, if they need ID, we're helping engage and bring them in for all of that. And uh, including medical services through through other partners that we are linked up with right here in Sunset Park. Munyuk is one. Some of you probably know about Munyuk. And so they can go and get eye tests, they can get HIV tests, they can get linked to care, they can get medications. And, and like I said, for the undocumented and the documented. So uh, we're still alive in Sunset Park, even though we're not on 4th um, Avenue anymore. We are do have another location where our outreach team is on 39th Street. All right, so thank, thank you. Laura, did you have something to say? Sure, I would just add that if I can give you the information or my information, um, if these are individuals who are chronically street homeless, we can try to have our outreach team engage with you at the church to see if we can assist individuals to come into a more permanent um, situation. So that would be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
Yes. Okay, thank you. Quick question. I have a quick question. How many homeless shelters do we have in Sunset Park? Including hotels. Twelve. That's not accurate at all. No. Um, I can tell you, just give me one second. I believe you have uh, three, you have three actual shelters, and then I believe you have six hotels. So, but, but they're not all, so shelters are actual shelters, hotels, we, they're considered temporary, so we wouldn't count that as a shelter per se. Uh, I believe it's eight. Is it nine? I believe it's eight. I will. I can. I will confirm and let know the, the actual number. In the past two years, there's been about eight. Okay. So how is it? How is it that Park Slope, depending on the corner you sit, you stand on it, it's either north or south. They have the women's shelter there. But all of a sudden, I, I wake up every morning. I live on 46th Street, and I see homeless. I, I'm not saying that I was homeless for 20 days, and it sucked. It totally sucked. But my question to you is, how is it that Sunset Park in the past two years, you got all these shelters. Meanwhile, you got Bowen Hill and, and South Park Slope or West Park Slope, whatever the hell you call it, has only one. All right, one. I'm going to follow on another question. question. Just what are the ranches? What are the ranches? No, I, I, have, well, I have to call on people. Let's not just we need answers. Ask questions. I'll call on people and then we can proceed in an orderly fashion, please. I have a one minute statement and a 20 second question. Introduce yourself. My name is Melissa de Valle Ortiz. I work for Congress Community of Alaska and I was homeless. <coughs> I was homeless for three years. When I came out of the military, I had no place to live. I was a single mom with two kids. I didn't have. I didn't have to stay in a shelter. I was lucky to have family to flow through. I was a victim of domestic violence. I currently live in Project Base Section 8 housing here in Sunset Park. I was lucky to find it. Because of that, I've been targeted as a tenant organizer and have routinely been taken to court by my management company. I am now the housing and community coordinator for the congresswoman here in the district. <coughs> I haven't ever done drugs. I haven't robbed anyone and I've never molested a child. So when my neighbors are stereotyping people that need housing, you're talking about me, and I take that personally. Um, my question to DHS is, what is DHS doing to empower those families that are living there, those people that need services, in order so that when a community rises up, you bridge the gap? that they're as empowered as we are, or as certain community residents are, to have them receive services, or to have them be located to other parts of the area. What are we doing to empower them? Located to other parts of the neighborhood uh, by way of permanent housing, or moving to a different shelter, or? In place. Are we educating them on their rights? Because they're also, I brought our handouts here for their tenant rights. As a home, as a person that resides in a homeless shelter, they have rights of house, as you said earlier. There's a calendar handle. So the sheet is here at the, on the table on your way out, you can take it. Um, and while residents, elder residents have the right to protest, and those rights are here too, they have a right to be, to, to be empowered and to be educated on their right to housing. So my question to DHS, if what is DHS doing to empower them in place while they reside so that when the community rises up to say, not in my backyard, they say, well, this is my backyard too. That is a very complicated question. And so I'll say a couple of things. The first thing is that as an agency, we make all of our clients aware of their rights within shelter to begin with. So they have an ombudsman, they have a way to, to work with us if they want to talk to us about their conditions in shelter. Separate and apart from that, our sites have housing specialists. Their role at the site is a part of the ILP or the independent living plan. It's just, I used to be a housing specialist at a DB shelter many years ago before I, I came on in this role. Their role is to essentially sit with clients, get them housing ready, and to 
connect them to the appropriate voucher to help them move out into an apartment. I mentioned earlier that a part of what the city has just done is to streamline their voucher program. So we had Advantage back in 2011 that was yanked out from under us. We saw a tremendous increase in homelessness because of it. Individuals in apartments who lost vouchers and got evicted <coughs> and ended up in our system. Under de Blasio, we then had well, FEPS at the state level, but we had city FEPS, and then we also, we, Section 8, you know, was, has been frozen, so that is still something that's challenging to get. And then we had the link voucher system for individuals who are in our, in our shelter system. So what the city has done recently is create something called City FEPS, which is one voucher where individuals and clients can be connected and hopefully in partnership with the city and with landlords have a better chance of working with landlords to get that apartment. So landlords would complain, they weren't getting paid, there was confusion, too many vouchers. What we hope with this new program is that it makes it easier for our clients to get out into the community and to work with us to find apartments. Separate and apart from that, I also explained that HRA started its own source of income discrimination unit. So in the city of New York, under the Human Rights Commission, it is illegal to discriminate on someone based on their source of income, and that includes vouchers and public assistance payments. And so if a landlord refuses to take someone because of a voucher, we now have the ability to engage that landlord and to advocate on behalf of those individuals to have access to those apartments. And so in terms of how the community helps us with that, if there are small landlords in the community who are willing to accept a voucher, then connecting with sites and connecting with DHS to let us know that you're willing to do that so that we can find clients who are housing ready, meaning that they have done the work needed to do to become as stable as they can be to be placed back into permanent housing so they may have a job they've gotten all their benefits they've gone back to school you know whatever the the, the, the circumstances have warranted for that individual just to clarify for the other gentlemen um, it is true that the system has built up over generations and there are communities we talk about seven there are communities with 20 there are communities with shelters that are so close together you would think that it might be its own neighborhood right and so what the purpose of turning the tide has been is to create some sort of equity across that system it is a slow going process meaning that we have try to rely on communities to help identify locations for sites. We are in heavily engaged in talks with CB6 to bring a site there. We have given every community board and every council member a letter encouraging them to work with us to help identify sites. You do not have to be on the receiving end and say, oh, well, the site just showed up. You have an opportunity to identify spaces and locations. Doesn't guarantee that we can take that, but we are willing to try to have conversations. If you identify places in a community, as the mayor has said, that every community is getting a site. And so that is what the plan has been, and that is what you are seeing. And so it may not still not look equitable. It's going to take time. This is an eight-year administration. We're talking about decades of the way in which the system has been built up and allowed to operate. And so it is going to take some time to make that shift to make the system more equitable. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone. We, we are seriously, we are out of time. We usually go for an hour. I know you guys have additional questions. We can answer those offline or at the next meeting. We encourage you to come and we love the community engagement. Uh, we, the community board, the committee has to de decide on the next meeting now. So, thank you. Yes, you can. It's right here.